Welcome to another episode of Legitimate Matters. This is your host, William Paris. Welcome to the show. I was thinking recently about the conversation and certainly what's been going on recently about mental wellness, mental health, and it occurred to me that Mental Health and certainly Mental Awareness Month has actually been established since 1949, but we're really just talking about it now. I also realized that Columbine, uh, the shooting at the school Columbine, took place in 1999, and here we are in 2019, and it seems that the crisis of mental illness is just now surfacing. Uh, in fact, uh, CNN recently released a report indicating that uh, suicide, as a matter of fact, was up 33% since 1999. And that's about how many years to, to date? So today I have the pleasure of welcoming my guest, Dr. Nee Addy. Dr. Nee Addy is an associate professor of psychiatry and cellular and molecular physiology at the Yale School of Medicine. He received his BS in biology from Duke University and his PhD in neuroscience from Yale University. At Yale, Dr. Addy directs a research lab where he and his staff investigate the neurobiological basis of substance abuse, depression, and anxiety. Dr. Nee, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Did I pronounce all the words right? You did. I'm impressed. <laughs> it's, it's always a mouthful. Right. Well, I'm glad <laughs> well I got done. it right. Well, I was reading your bio, and mm -hmm. certainly I've had an opportunity to, to meet you, and we've had uh, some conversations mm -hmm. about the things that, that you do in your profession and your focus right. in psychiatry. And unlike... Uh, clinicians that meet with patients mm -hmm. and, and determine what the cause of mental illness is or whatever the symptoms might necessarily represent mm -hmm. for the client, you're coming from a whole different perspective. Right. You're in the laboratory and, and doing research on mm -hmm. something that is so important and is really relevant in, uh, today. So tell us what you do. So just basically as a, so as you mentioned, I'm a neuroscientist by training and so that implies and suggests that we're actually studying the brain in particular. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're most interested in is what happens in the brain that actually guides our behavior. So how does that happen for us as human beings and how does that happen um, for us as a, as a species and how does that happen from lower species all the way up to human beings. And also being in the psychiatry department, we're particularly interested in behaviors that are associated with psychiatric illnesses. So a lot of times in the field, we'll talk about those things being maladaptive behaviors. So a lot of times when I give talks to students or I'm mm -hmm. talking to the community, I ask people to just share with me mm -hmm. what behaviors come to mind when you think about specific psychiatric illnesses or psychiatric okay. struggles. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, what, what behavior comes to mind when you think about depression? What behavior comes to mind when you think about anxiety? What behavior comes to mind when you think about addiction or substance abuse? And basically what we're trying to do in the lab is to understand what's happening in the brain that actually allows that behavior to occur. And can we understand how that behavior is occurring in the brain, what's happening in the brain, and can we actually potentially change what happens in the brain to change the behavior? And there's lots of different ways that can happen. That can happen through different medications, that can happen through different behavioral trainings. And so for us, it's really just trying to understand the brain piece of that and then trying to integrate that with a lot of the other things that are available to us um, as scientists and as individuals who are deeply invested in mental health. When I think about that and you say, uh, when you think about mental illness, mm -hmm. what types of symptoms or behavior mm -hmm. comes to mind? And that is such a broad spectrum. Right, right. You have individuals that uh, certainly there is a sleep disorder that's mm -hmm. associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, there's manic behavior mm -hmm. and then there's uh, depression. And, mm -hmm. and depression is different 
with with many different people. Right, right. So if you're talking about to a a, a male versus a female mm -hmm. or a teen, mm -hmm. uh, it, it could take shape in so many different forms. Right. So what does your research uh, focus on neurologically? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, in order to identify what initiates that behavior. Right, right. That's a great question. So before I get to the question, just to highlight, you've brought up a great point. Okay. So when we're talking about mental illness, one of the challenges is that it can look different for different mm, types of mm, people. Okay. So depression is a great example, and okay. you brought up sleep as well. You, you sound like you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> so sleep in particular. So mm -hmm. some people with depression will sleep a lot more. Right. Some people with depression may sleep a lot less, mm -hmm. but that's still all categorized under depression. Right. And the challenge for us as a field is that People may both, two different individuals may both have depression, but they may have depression for different underlying reasons. And so the challenge there is knowing what's the best way to address that for individual A versus individual B. So really in the lab, we're trying to understand what that means from a biological perspective. So the biology of the brain in particular. So the work that we do is actually just trying to set up models where we can try to understand some of those pieces. So in particular, we usually use rodent models. Um, so rats and mice in particular, which have been used in research uh, for decades, uh, longer actually. Mm -hmm. um, and what we can do there is to ask, well, are there certain behaviors? So obviously it's difficult to ask a rodent, are you depressed? But we can do different types of analyses. And so for instance, like humans, rodents will like, they like to drink things that are sweet. So one of the things that we'll do is to allow them to drink a, sweet, a sweetened uh, solution of water compared to just normal water and to see how much of the animal, how much of the animals will actually prefer that sweet solution to a different solution. Mm -hmm. And if animals are isolated, like people, sometimes they'll go into a state where they won't actually take as much of the sweet solution or other different situations. So at that point, what we can do is actually try and look in the brain using specific probes and understand what has changed in the brain that actually pushes that animal to have less of a desire for something that's pleasurable. Um, and there are different ways that we can do those types of things. Um, to actually get some insight. We can also do things that are related to anxiety. So rodents, for instance, don't like to be out in the open. They like to be in enclosed spaces. So in a sense, a rodent that is quote unquote less anxious may spend more time exploring in a certain environment. An animal that's less anxious or more anxious won't spend as much time. And we found that there are certain things that can change aspects of the brain, either in rodents or in humans, and you'll see similar types of behaviors emerge. Okay, I, I, I'm listening to you, and now mm -hmm. you've just opened up my mind, <laughs> uh, and now I have tons of questions, but I'll tell you what, we're gonna go to break, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna try to digest what you just said to me, mm -hmm. and when we come back from break, we're gonna dig a little deeper and find out more about that. Excellent. William Paris, Legitimate Matters, stick with us. This is an interesting conversation. We'll be right back. <laughs> 